Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this live WTG webinar. My name is Athena, and I'll be moderating this session. Our topic today is Seven Secrets of Success for Next Generation Learning, and will be presented by Laura Overton. Before we begin, please let me quickly explain a few things. This session is using audio broadcast, so you should be hearing me through your computer speakers or headphones. If for any reason you have a problem with the audio, you can always dial in. Please send me a message via the chat box to the right-hand side of your screen. Address it to uh, hr.webinar, and I will enable your dialing details. You may also have noticed that you can only see your own name in the participants list. This is down to the purposes of privacy, and I can assure you you're not alone. You're actually being joined by many other attendees from around the world, but again, in the interests of anonymity, all your names are hidden. If you have any questions for our speaker, then please use the Q&A box. This way we won't miss any questions at the very end of today's presentation. Just pop your question in the box and we'll do our best to get through as many questions as possible. Any questions that are missed uh, will be followed up on directly by our speakers post-event. Uh, finally, if you would like to speak to me, please use the chat box. Also, uh, feel free to send us a message and let us know where you're attending from today. Uh, it would be great to hear from you. Uh, and uh, this leaves me with nothing more to say than to thank you all for joining us and to welcome today's presenter. Hello, Laura. Uh, we are delighted to have you with us today. And uh, the floor is now yours. Please take it away. Good morning and good afternoon and uh, good evening to everyone who's joined us on this webinar today. I know I can see already a few people have let us know in from Australia and from the States and from Europe. So it's really exciting to be able to come together in this session to think about how we can become a top learning company. And what we want to do today is to share with you um, perhaps some secrets of success that we've found through the research that we've been doing. But we're very interested to know if you contribute your comments to, to me directly about how you resonate with some of the ideas today. Do these make sense to you? Is this something that you're actually doing for yourselves? So please do use the chat room and um, be able to connect through with that. Now, a couple of people are saying that they can't get through to the audio. Um, so um, it would be great to know if you can hear us. So if you can hear me, uh, do just send me a quick note saying uh, that you're able to to hear. Um, so Athena, if that's okay with you, we can double check on that, um, that we, people can actually hear. So... I'm getting messages that people can actually hear us right now. Fantastic, fantastic. That's yeah. good news. So, yeah. If anyone is facing uh, issues, please send me a message. I will uh, enable your dialing details right now. Okay, thank you. That's great. Thanks, Athena. So, so my name is Laura Overton, and I've been uh, working in the learning and development industry for really the last uh, 25 plus years. Um, so it's been very exciting to see how many changes there have been within the learning and development profession. And particularly in the last 10 years, through our organization Towards Maturity, we've been researching how learning and development is, ch development is changing and how technology is supporting the change in those organizations. But one of the things we've really noticed while we've been conducting our research is the pressure that most learning and development departments are under in the corporate world. So whether you're supporting a not-for-profit uh, workforce or a private sector workforce or a, a public sector um, workforce, it seems to me that in the research that we're doing both anecdotally and also formally, there is so much change that we're having to deal with now that we weren't doing perhaps 20-odd um, years ago. I think some of the key elements that we've seen um, in terms of the pressures that we're under, is this whole area of change. The fact that our organizations are changing, our customers are changing, our workforce is changing, and the business around us is really needing to be able to respond faster and quicker. Another key trend we're also finding as well is globalization. As an audience, uh, our audiences potentially are around the globe, our customers potentially are around the globe, but also we found that organizations are looking very much now more so than ever at this whole bigger picture about competitive advantage as a result of talent and skills. And so all of these things, including the issue of compliance, 
are really putting pressure on today's learning and development department who typically are having to address all of these new issues and yet with fewer and fewer resources. So we're finding, and I don't know whether that resonates with you. If it does, do, 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 let, do let us know in, in the chat room. But what we're finding, though, when we think about that kind of pressure is that the way that we respond to that pressure is really the key to our success. They say the best diamonds are created under the most intense pressure, and that's certainly what we've seen. So what kind of successful secrets have we got, can we see in top learning companies who've responded to this new world that's been driven by technology, driven by change, driven by globalization, and how are we actually responding to that? What does a successful learning and development department actually look like in that new world? Well, I'd really like to ask you that question, if I may, for you to kind of, if you think about the characteristics of a successful learning and development function today, what comes to mind to you? And you've got the chat box um, at the side or the question box, and it would be great if you could just put in uh, some of those words that characterize a really successful learning organization. It might be that you're thinking about your own organization and you believe that you've really responded well and are successful. You know, what are the characteristics? Or it may be that you've heard stories of other organizations um, as well. So do, do let us know um, what kind of words are coming to mind for you. So some of the ideas um, that we can perhaps think about are the way that you're connecting through with your business and the relationships that you have with business. What, you know, what kind of success, what does success look like there? What does success look like when it comes down to your learners and the way they engage with the programs that you're looking for? And what does success look like in terms of the results that you're delivering to your organization? So it's really helpful to actually see some of... Um, some of these thoughts coming through. And I think one of the things that um, does come through quite strongly is the fact that people are looking more and more for agility. And one of the things that we found in our last um, benchmark work that we did was something like nine out of ten of us are looking to respond faster to changing business conditions. So that really is a very strong theme. The other theme that seems to be coming through as well is the, re the successful organization is also helping to share good practice within the business and with the organization, not just to deliver courses, and so that we're broadening our mindset in the way that we do things. So these are quite useful. Do keep um, those, those comments um, coming through. Um, but for us at Towards Maturity, our definition of success really went right back to our very, very first report, Linking Learning to Business, which we did in 2004. We gathered data 10 years ago, um, at right now in 2003. And what we went and looked at is organizations who are being perceived to be successful, in inverted commas. We didn't know what success looked like at that point in time, but we knew that those organizations were embracing technology well, were winning awards, were really achieving some interesting things, and they were all recommended to us as an organization, as organizations who are, are doing learning well that others aspired to look, be, look, be like. But what we found when we really dug into success in those organizations, we found 2,000 learners from those 15 organizations were saying, this learning is helping me do my job better. This learning is helping me progress my career. And ultimately, definition for me of a successful organization has really been driven from our very first report. So we believe successful learning and development organizations are those who make a positive impact on their staff, not just engaging them in courses and getting completion rates, but engaging them with learning, that they appeal to staff motivation, that they're retaining staff more effectively, that they're supporting staff productivity and enhancing staff productivity. So our definition of success also thinks through things like bottom line results, that the learning organizations are actually delivering 
to the bottom line of the business in the areas that count. And they're doing all of this whilst also thinking about how can we do learning itself better, faster, getting improved quality, delivering more for less, but not delivering just technology-enabled learning. The focus for the successful organization is the fact that they are delivering more quality, more staff impact, more bottom line results, but doing it effectively and cost efficiently and are really adding bottom line value. So that for us certainly has been what's been driving our benchmark research in the last number of years. Our first study highlighted what success could look like and what top learning companies are doing. But our subsequent studies that we've been doing, and we've been involved with over 2,900 organizations in the last 10 years, has been really focused on the issue is why is it that some organizations are more successful than others? And we as an organization, we're a not-for-profit benchmarking practice. And we make our research widely available, completely free of charge, because we believe that this independent advice should be made available to as many people as possible who are looking to become more successful in their learning and development function. So we always like to say a big thank you to the organizations who get behind, to share those values about independence and getting good advice out there. And uh, certainly success factors have been one of our founding supporters in our work for a while. And what we've found over the last number of years is that organizations that are successful are walking the walk of some of these secrets I'm going to be talking to you about, not just talking the talk. And for the last few minutes of this, of this presentation, I want to kind of unpick some of the key findings that we've identified. What we've done over the last number of years, and as I say, starting from 16 organizations in 2003, and now having worked with over 2,900 organizations, We've been looking at what does good look, like, good look like around the world. Now, as you can tell from my accent, I am based in the UK, in fact, in Wimbledon, in London. But our benchmark participants take play, part from around the globe. And we, this year alone, we had something like 44 different nations get involved from all kinds of sectors. Typically, it's larger organizations who get involved with our, with our benchmarking program. But what we've found consistently is there seems to be six key areas that we call, we've grouped together in the Towards Maturity model that really contribute to success. And these areas I'm going to dig into a little bit more, in a little bit more detail to share with you some of the most poignant secrets hidden within this model. But overall, what we find is that when we look at individual organizations' overall behavior against this model, we can allocate through to them a single index. And we found that those organizations that are more mature according towards the Towards Maturity Index are delivering better results. So when we compare the bottom quartile to the top quartile, those in the top quartile of this index are reporting seven times more productivity, seven times more agility and performance, three times the ability to be able to bring their staff on board faster and quicker and bring, reducing their time to competence. So this maturity model is really making a difference to the bottom line impact of organizations. So what I'd like to do is to kind of unpick this model and to identify from my perspective some of the areas that I really think underpin success when we think about success as being business impact, staff impact, and learning efficiency. So let's just take a look at the first one. I think the key area for me is that the top learning companies are really focused in on defining the need that they need to meet from a business perspective, both strategically and also tactically, project by project. So they're going to be the types of organizations who think about what is it my organization needs to achieve 
rather than what courses do I need to provide. Now, we found overall in our benchmark from last year that something like two-thirds of their learning initiatives support the skills that the business actually needs, which means that maybe a third of what we're doing as learning and development functions are actually not necessarily supportive of what the business needs. Now, we find that overall, only a third of organizations actually even work with any kind of senior managers to identify the kind of business priorities that they're wanting to improve with learning. So a majority of us are responding to a demand for courses rather than having a conversation about what is it that you want to be able to do differently as a result of this learning intervention. And this type of alignment is a two-way alignment. It's not just us supporting the business, but the business understanding what the learning and development function can do for them as well. So this is really our first secret of success. And again, not very many organizations are doing this, and I'd be very happy to um, kind of take any questions that you might have as to why um, organizations aren't doing this. But what we find when we compare those in the top quartile of our index to those in the bottom quartile, that they are actually three and a half times more likely to agree that they analyze the business need and problem before recommending a solution. And they're seven times more likely at a strategic level to say, you know, our overall learning strategy can flow with the business. So if our business changes, then we have a strategy overall that adapts to that business need. So there's some very proactive things that organizations are doing to get this two-way alignment. And it certainly underpins the whole core of the maturity model that top learning companies are doing. The second secret of success is that I'd like us to think about the context of individuals. We've spoken a lot already about the needs of the business and the organization, the top learning organizations, the top learning departments are really driven by that. But it's not just the needs of the business. It's also the context of those busy staff that we're supporting as well. So we think about things like learner context. What motivates the individual? What choices? What availability? The what's in it for me? Because they need to be engaging at a personal level. We talk a lot about personalized learning, but we need to engage at a very personal level. But it's also the work context of that individual too. The line management culture, the issues of talent and onboarding and the bigger HR strategy. So that wider context of the busy staff is something that the top learning companies balance in their consideration of how do they deliver learning that supports the personalized needs of individuals. And so, for example, the top learning companies compared with the bottom quartile are six and a half times more likely, for example, to be aware of how their staff use social media. Now, this is an interesting example because technology is changing the world around us. We know that. But many organizations don't know how their staff are currently using technology for themselves, let alone what we provide to them, to help them do their job better. But the top learning companies are open to that, and they are thinking and they're proactive about saying, oh, if we're designing learning for the future, we need to ask this question of individuals. And we've had, you know, even in the last six months, something like 2,500 individual learners go through our learning landscape program to kind of reflect on how it is that they're learning what they need for their job. And that, in turn, is providing their learning and development departments with insights about the landscape in which they're delivering their learning solutions. And sometimes that landscape identifies a number of, 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 of boulders and of obstacles that we need to get through. But sometimes the landscape opens up brand new opportunities as learning and development functions perhaps we hadn't considered before. So asking questions and being aware of how staff are currently learning for themselves is something that's really worth considering. The other thing that they're looking at doing as well is tying in 
the learning that's being delivered in an organization with the overall talent strategy from recruitment to high potentials to performance management where does this learning fit in where does it fit in with the career progression for that individual as well so understanding the need of the business and balancing it with the need of the individual is something that really sets the top learning organizations um, apart and so far we've been talking a lot about how technology is enabling these processes. And I don't think we can get away from the fact that, yes, technology is a very important factor for any type of learning organization and certainly for the top learning organizations. You know, as businesses and individuals are embracing technologies, so are successful learning teams. And this word cloud just shows you some of the technologies that were being used by those that took part in the Tools and Maturity benchmark last year. The variety and breadth is very, very wide. It is allowing us to do things that we, couldn't be able, we weren't able to do before. But when we analyze, do these tools themselves actually impact the successful organization? Do the use of these tools correlate directly back to the things we were talking about before, business impact, staff impact, efficiency? we find that the correlations aren't necessarily that strong. So one of the secrets of success that we want to consider is not the fact that people are using technology. So the technology itself is not one of the secrets. But what we do with those technologies, our confidence within our own teams is a secret and we found that the capability the top learning organizations are building capability within their own learning and development teams let me give you some examples of this they're six times as likely to agree that their learning and development teams are confident about incorporating new media in their own programs and as a result of that they're doing more continuing professional development more teamwork more innovation more more um trialing new things out within their teams to build that confidence. They are also building the skills. They're investing in skills like designing online content, delivering webinars, seminars, blended learning programs, instructional design. The new program um, design is being invested in in those learning and development teams. And the top learning companies are 17 times more likely to agree that their staff have got the right skills to design those solutions. Not just to exploit the technologies, but to exploit them to business advantage. So again, this is about aligning that learning and development team with the bigger picture. And we also find that the top learning teams are actually much more open-minded. 80% of the top, top companies in the top quartile agree that their learning and development staff consider the course, whether it's an online course or a face-to-face -face, face course, um, as being one of just one of the many options for building skills. And yet, in the bottom quarter, those who aren't necessarily as mature in their thinking in this process are very much fixed as the course as being the only option. So having confident and capable learning and development team is an investment that's really worth making because it has a bottom line impact on the results that you're going to get. But the fourth secret of success that I want to share is really digging into this open-mindedness a little bit more. What does that look like? And we're finding that the fourth secret of success is that top learning organizations are thinking differently about the way that they do formal learning. The course program, the pathway that individuals go through, the course that has a start and a finish. And the top learning companies are going to be thinking more creatively about the blends in that process. They're going to be thinking more creatively about delivering qualifications to people and, and individuals. Excuse me a moment. Excuse me a moment. What we found that is absolutely amazing in terms of the difference, a really accelerator in performance, is they're proactive in training their classroom trainers to use technology to extend learning beyond the classroom. And it's a great example in, in the UK about the Royal School of Artillery, who had a very, very important life or death program 
to be able to deliver that they were delivering in the classroom training, which is about training their soldiers in the theatre when they're in the line of fire, when they're attacked suddenly by the enemy, about communication back in back to headquarters. Incredibly pressurised environments, absolutely essential to get that skill of communication right. Traditionally, it was all done in the classroom classroom programme, but they started to use mobile, they started to use games, they started to create tablets that were brought into the classroom to help people practice under fire. And those practice games were extended outside of the classroom. And what it did is it built the confidence and built the skills within the organization. But those trainers needed to know, they need to embrace those new, new tools within the program in order to have that impact beyond the classroom. But the top learning companies aren't just thinking differently about formal learning, but they're also thinking about differently about how do we extend learning beyond the classroom. And again, something like 9 out of 10 learning organizations involved in our study in the last two years are saying, you know, we have to find new ways of helping people apply what they've learned. How do we address the issue of the ebbing out forgetting curve? This is something that's a priority for us now. And we're finding that those top learning companies are being are actually doing things about it, about enhancing performance at that point of need. So they're, for example, they're six and a half times more likely compared with the bottom quartile to be providing staff with access to online job aids or via the mobile. But they're also just more likely in general to be using job aids in their training that people can extend. Now, something that's so simple to be able to take from the classroom into the world of work, and yet we still find that probably only about 60% of organizations are doing it even at the basic, most basic level. But the top learning companies are doing it much more. They're also much more in tune with the defined performance support practices that already exist within their organization. And they're thinking through creatively, again, how to break down that silo between performance support and learning to be able to extend the support of formal learning. So they're thinking differently all the time. And they're not just thinking about how can I do what I used to do, um, but perhaps more efficiently, but how can I do things completely differently within the way that we're designing learning? The fifth area, which I think is really important and under the tools maturity model, which is about ensuring engagement, is the fact that the top learning companies don't take change for granted. They know that when you're introducing new ways of learning or new programs or even revamping existing programs, that there are a whole range of stakeholders that we need to engage with and are very proactive in stakeholder engagement, stakeholder management, and managing change within the organization. So they are connecting with the line managers. They understand the impact of the line managers um, in business, and they're proactive in thinking that through. Now, the research that we've done with learners directly shows that something like 55% of learners say that it's their line manager that influences how they learn at work. And less than 10% say that it's anything to do with the learning and development or even HR function. So the top learning companies in not taking change for granted are proactive in thinking through how do we engage with the most influential stakeholders who are going to have the most impact on the staff that we're trying to connect with learning. And one of the things that the top learning companies do is that they're much more proactive in providing line managers, for example, with resources to help their teams make the most of some of these new ways of learning compared to just 1% of bottom quartile um, companies in, in our index. So you can see this kind of focus on stakeholder engagement, thinking through what do, who is, who's going to influence change and how do we support that change process is an absolute critical element to the successful learning organization. The next and um, penultimate success factor we found, and it's, and it's re a really important link back 
to what we were talking about earlier on about business is that the top learning companies are proactive in thinking about how to demonstrate the value that they're bringing back to the business. Now, I'm not talking here about the fact that they do a return on investment calculation, but they're, they're clearly thinking through how do we demonstrate that value back. They are more likely, for example, to be using anecdotal case studies. They are more likely, for example, to be able to... Um, to look at um, uh, you know, sort of people sharing good practice with each other, to be encouraging staff to share what they've learned and how they've applied it with each other, and therefore using that to highlight how they're demonstrating value. Earlier on, we said that the, a third, about a third of organizations work up front in the process to identify those business metrics. But less than half of them, around about 16%, actually even go back after their learning initiative to see how the learning has improved, whether anecdotally or formally in that process. So this demonstrating value process is something that many of us need to be thinking through because it's certainly a characteristic that those top learning companies are seven times more likely to be reporting against those targets and also 10 times more likely to be shouting about their success. Top learning companies aren't modest. They are proud of what they're achieving with their business, and they find every opportunity to be able to communicate that. And that in itself stimulates demand, stimulates action, stimulates hunger for learning across the organization. And so that really leads me to my final secret of success, the kind of underpins all of this model is that these organizations are communicating constantly. They, cons they communicate with business leaders to identify what's needed. They communicate with their training and learning functions, making sure everyone's lined up. They communicate with their learners. They communicate with their stakeholders and the line managers um, as well. And in fact, we found that they're five times as likely to have not only a communications plan in place, but have a plan that constantly, constantly is refreshed in communicating those results, those successes. Now, you would say probably that, you know, we're communicating an awful lot, but when we actually talk directly to learners, and as I say, over the last 10 years, it's nearly 4,500 learners that we've had feedback from, and whether they're in a top learning organization or not, probably less than half of them believe they fully understand the solutions that we're providing. So we need to be constantly thinking through how do we connect and how do we um, kind of go with that flow. So here are just some, as I say, some of those secrets of success. This is a quick checklist. What it's not about is about technology, and what it's not about is about courses. But successful learning organizations are doing these things. They're aligning to business priorities. They're considering the context of the individual and balancing business and uh, individual and organizational needs. They're building capable and confident learning and development teams. They're innovating their formal and informal learning. They don't take change for granted. They're change managers. They demonstrate value and they communicate constantly. So it's just a, a few of the things that we've, um, we've identified um, to give you just a very practical checklist. And uh, we'd encourage you to obviously get involved um, with our benchmark because obviously it will help you to understand how you map in with those top learning organizations. Um, but what I want to do now is to really hand over um, to my colleague to actually give you an example of how this actually works out in practice within an organization. So, Athena, sh shall I um, hand back to you to uh, introduce Jenny, because Jenny's story is going to blow your minds on how this can all work out in practice. Athena. Fantastic. Wow, what an introduction. Can, it, can you hear me? Jenny, yes, we can. I can hear you. <laughs> Oh, perfect, perfect, perfect. I just wasn't sure. All right, fantastic. Um, all right. I love, um, I love what you said, um, aren't modest and are proud, because it's uh, one of my favorite things to do is to talk about 
uh, my organization and the successes that we've had. So absolutely um, uh, fantastic to hear, uh, Laura, your, um, your research. I'm a huge fan of your organization, so this is very fun to uh, be presenting with you. So hi, everyone. I'm Jenny Dearborn. I'm the Chief Learning Officer and Vice President for Cloud Talent Success at Success Factors and SAP, uh, SAP Cloud Business. Um, in my scope, I manage all the customer, external customer business. So someone buys software and we make sure that they are, are trained to as system administrators how to use that, all the partner enablement for our sales partners and our service partners, and all of the employee learning. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about primarily um, in this presentation is the internal employee learning because that's most relevant to other chief learning officers and other um, most learning organizations. I spent about 20 years in the learning and development field, starting as an instructor and an instructional designer and sort of progressing to executive positions. Um, this is my third company in the chief learning officer role, so I've had a lot of experience um, doing this and just absolutely thrilled to be co-presenting with you, Lauren, um, and uh, just sharing some examples um, of what we have done and sort of how it lines up with the model that Laura has um, shared with you. So first of all, I'm going to start by bragging. Um, this is just uh, our most recent awards slide. Um, our learning organization was formed about a year and a half ago. We had three people a year and a half ago when we started, and since then we've worked really hard to win these prestigious international industry awards, uh, especially in the center there being recognized as number one in the Learning 100 Award for the number one best corporate learning department in the world for 2013. So that's great validation um, of the impact of our efforts and our hard work. Um, and the theme of all of these awards really is around demonstrating business value um, and demonstrating the impact of what we've done. Um, so let's run through these, these seven secrets of success, and I'll share some examples with you um, from what my team has done. So um, I really love being a learning and development business partner because I love um, really aligning the work we do to the strategic intent of the of the business. And we really stand out by providing strategic learning development business partners uh, to the organizations that we support, like sales, professional services, customer support, engineering, et cetera, all the different internal organizations. And so learning and development business partners are people in my organization um, who are wearing a second hat as a business partner. And, and they, are, they have other roles, right? They're an instructor an instructional designer, a training coordinator, et cetera. Um, but they also wear a hat as a, as a business partner. And the business partners pro provide support to each business unit, and they share valuable learning content and recommended appropriate solutions to accelerate uh, or improve team productivity. And we do this, the, the business partner role, we do this by joining team meetings, quarterly business reviews, and scheduling one-on-one -on -one meetings with our key stakeholders. Um, and we also, um, in this, we learn from the business. We learn what are the business goals. We learn what is that business sort of balance scorecard, their priorities, their objectives, their KPIs. And through sort of ruthless prioritization, we can make sure that what the actions, the activities, the, uh, the, the learning that we are rolling out is perfectly aligned to the business, right, to what is their most important thing. And I think that's a, a common um, uh, you know, hurdle with other organizations, you know, with other learning organizations thinking to themselves, am I working on the right thing? You know, is this, are these learning activities that my staff is, is driving, is this what's most important to my business client? So having a second hat where everybody in your organization is aligned to a business client will help you answer that question. So that's one thing we do. Um, Considering the context, I think, is also really important. Um, and the context is going to be different for every, uh, for every learning organization, right? The, your own context is different for you. For me, uh, the context for us is that we are um, in the HR business, right? So it's really important that we showcase the world's best internal HR, right? We sell human resources 
products. And so our internal human resources needs to be absolutely world-class and exceptional. Um, and so we do that by using our own products, using our own tools in order to be best in class so that we can showcase that to our, um, to our clients. And so it really helps connect the dots for my staff to be able to help them see this context and see this big picture. And that context is going to be different uh, for each organization. But typically, drinking your own champagne, if you are a software company, drinking your own champagne is going to be vital um, context for your staff to understand. Um, this is one of my favorite ones also. Um, I love um, leading a team of confident and capable um, uh, learning professionals who embrace technology. Um, I really encourage the um, extended folks of my team. There are now 85 people in my extended organization, and I take their professional development very seriously. And our organization's goal in driving, um, in addition to driving the business impact results for our clients, is also to be industry thought leaders. And I really encourage them uh, to do this and showcase that they are industry thought leaders by presenting at conferences, writing articles, writing blogs, tweeting, things like that, being known in the industry for their thoughts and ideas. And by submitting applications for awards and speaking at conferences like, like ASTD, we really build our confidence and our brand as a best-in-class enablement organization for the learners that we support. Also, being an award-winning organization is great for their confidence, and it's sort of a virtuous, positive cycle, right? It just builds on positive energy. It's great for recruiting learning professionals to my organization. They want to work at an organization that's best in the world, and they want to work in an organization that's going to push them and develop them and grow them, and you really demand a lot from them you know, in order for them to, to be their best selves. And um, so it's, it's very positive. Uh, some of the things that we do is I'm, uh, I'm very keen on having folks in my staff to be certified in uh, the latest uh, programs that are relevant for them. So for example, uh, the instructional designers in my organization are certified in the newest development tools, like um, Articulate, for example, is just one, is just one of many. Uh, the instructors, um, just all my instructors just finished getting certified um, in uh, virtual uh, learning delivery. And um, they're also often certified in external vendor courses, which are, is great for their resume, and they feel like they're really growing that way. Um, um, but the in-sync training that they attended helped them build on their ability to deliver exciting and interesting virtual, um, virtual training. And then the sales success mentor team, which is like an internal professional coach that's assigned to new hire sales reps, uh, they just finished their one-year certification um, from, to be professional coaches from the International Coaching Federation. So again, it's, it's great for recruiting because – you know, I can say, come and work for me, and I will invest in you. I will grow you. I will put things on your resume that make you a more valuable employee, and um, and that adds to their confidence. And they they work extra hard knowing that I'm going to um, make investing in their development a top priority. Um, in the fourth one, in Laura's model, you know, we we do a great job of embracing technology. Um, that is forever being improved and, and changed, right? Um, but we also make sure that it's learner-centric. So it's a little bit of a caution here. So embrace innovation, but don't just go with the latest fad. Uh, you need to be learner-centric. You need to think, is this relevant to my learners, right? What does my audience want? Will this benefit them? Sometimes your audience will push you and say, hey, I demand learning. I de demand virtual instructor-led. I, I demand things to be more innovative. Um, and sometimes the learning department will get ideas and, and ways to push the learner. So both of them are okay, but it's a kind of a balance and you need to always be checking in and what's appropriate for your learners. Um, some of the um, applications that we use for uh, delivering on the web-based 
content. I already said it was Articulate. Um, we use a social collaboration platform. We use our own internal product, SAP Jam. Um, all of our courses are accessed through our um, learning management system, which has got a lot of really cool features and functions that, that learners love. Um, so, so again, it's you know cutting edge technology is fantastic, but also sort of balancing with what is interesting and what, what's appropriate for your audience. Um, you know, also through meeting learners where they are, what's uh, what's of, of primary interest to them, and and also what is the what are the websites that they like to go to? What is the sites that they like to visit? Can you embed learning in the places where they already are? Right? You know, do they, is there a certain portal that your um, your team likes to hang out on? Like maybe a sales portal or something. You know, you should think: Do I need to create a separate learning portal and say my learning portal is my one-stop shop? Everyone come to me, come to my site. Or if everybody is already trained in your target learner group to go to a different site, you know, because that's what that business unit's leader wants is to get them, them focused on some other site, maybe you should embed learning where they already are. So meet your learners where they want to be online. And of course, everything needs to be blended in order to extend it beyond um, the classroom. So anything that you do should be a blended experience. Um, on the bottom left-hand corner, there's a, um, a screenshot of the SAP Jam product. So everything that we do has a Jam component, right? Um, it's folded in um, a, sort of a, this online performance support and social collaboration uh, framework with all of our instructor-led um, courses. Um, we have in the top um, right hand, I have a, a little shot of App Central. And so App Central is where we put all of our learning apps, right? So people can download to their phone um, or their iPad or their laptop um, applications for quick learning um, information to come to them. Um, the MOOC is something that we are just launching. That's the massively open online course. Um, and um, we are launching uh, several of our uh, virtual instructor-led courses in that framework. Again, that is our, um, our learners are demanding this, right? So we have 15 people per virtual online course, and it needs to be small because it's highly interactive. Uh, there's a lot of um, uh, labs and quizzes and discussion and things like that, but we were finding a huge backlog of people wanting to get into this class. So we've redesigned it so into the MOOC format. Um, so the MOOC is all the lecture, and you could be you could have a thousand learners, right? That's that's the beauty of the MOOC model. You could have a thousand learners, and then you put in a separate experience, the interactivity, and now there's not you know those uh, those wait lists uh, are gone. So um, uh, that's uh, just a few examples of uh, innovating the formal learning that we have. Um, change is something that is absolutely constant, right? Every day we're selling change uh, to our learners. And our learners are our customers and our clients. Um, there will be active change resistors in your scope. So always be thinking about you know, what is the current state where your learners are now and what is the future state that the corporation or the business unit is asking them to change to. And then think about well, what's in it for them, right? Learning drives change. Change in behaviors, change in knowledge, change in skills or actions, anything that you are teaching them, you're asking them to change. And so it's important mindset um, for, for anybody in a learning organization is to remember that the change is hard, right? And, and sometimes what we're asking people to do is difficult for them. Um, and if you, if you approach the learning experience for your target audience as really a change management experience, it's going to be a whole lot more effective. So one of the things I tell my teams is to, is to remember the principles of change management every day, right? Um, and that, you know, those principles are around, you know, what is the current state? What is the future state? What are you asking them to do? And what's in it for them, right? Make it very learner-centric. So in this fast-paced environment, in order to stay competitive, we always need to be considering additional ways to support our 
learners and their teams and helping the organization understand the offerings and uh, the value of what we deliver them in our learning solutions is really half the battle. So critical for change management is communication, which needs to be very targeted at the right level at, in the organization. So our unique uh, brand at Success Factors for the Learning Team and our award-winning record helps to raise awareness. And like Laura said, it's, it, it feeds on itself. Like the more awards we get, the more people want that, oh, I, wanna, I, want, I want some of that, right? I want to take some of that award-winning learning. And so it, just, it becomes a positive upward spiral. So we, it, we also found that everyone expects change management in a different way. So the communication really needs to be targeted by, by role and, and by level. So there's going to be a different... Um, change management for executives. They tend to want lots of one-on-one -on -one meetings, like tell me what's going on in the learning organization, tell me how my employees are doing, um, you know, uh, what is the business impact at an executive level. That's going to be a different type of communication to, to um, articulate that change. Managers want something different. The learners typically want role-based learning paths, and this is in a, the screenshot here is um, is an example of by role the different um, learning paths um, for a particular um, for a particular change. This one's one of my favorite. I love demonstrating um, the value of what we do. Our learning approach is that if you can't prove that it has value, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Right? Resources. Uh, from the organization, really patience from your executive sponsors, um, you know, is that they want to see learning development drive what they care about, right? My clients want me to improve close rate, sales close rate, um, sales ramp time, productivity, and they want me to decrease attrition. They really don't care if 300 people took a course and the level one evaluation score was five out of five, right? If I were to tell them that, they would roll their eyes and say that I'm out of touch, right? They don't care about learning jargon and learning metrics. They care about business key performance indicators, and they care about business metrics. So if, you, if it doesn't make a difference to the business, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. And my team tracks sales, productivity metrics uh, that are important to the business, and we show how our learning programs aligns and drives that performance. So, for example, just a few examples. Uh, new sales reps with a sales success mentor. It's an internal coach I told you about on a different slide. So new sales reps with a sales success mentor assigned to them on day one that also attended a two-week boot camp in the first four weeks of hire had a 300% higher close rate than new hires who did not do either of those things. Right? Came to boot camp at six weeks and maybe got a mentor at four weeks. Right? 300% higher close rate. After our uh, sales learning curriculum was redesigned and launched at the beginning of 2012, new hire sales reps, their ramp time was cut in half, and they were also three times more likely to reach quota in 2012 than 2011. And because in 2012, the, the sales new hires saw such a, a strong path to success, attrition was down 80% from the previous year. So that's the type of data that is important to my clients. I'll show just one uh, sort of map of this. What we do to, to articulate that, you, so this is for sales. This is just one of my clients. I have something similar for each of my client areas that I support. So you can see across the top there are the six stages of the sales cycle. And for each stage, I have what are the business metrics that the business is measuring about themselves at that stage. So sales want, stage one is um, suspect. The business metrics are the number of opportunities and the quality of the opportunities, and then the competencies that a sales rep would need to drive those metrics are prospecting, account research, messaging, qualification, access to C-level executive decision makers. And then the courses where we teach those skills are boot camp, CXO relevancy, prospecting, and sales coaching. And you can sort of see it lines up. Some, some of the 
some of the classes line up just with one of those stages. And there's just one of those metrics. So when someone takes a course, I measure their um, CRM activity for that stage, for that metric, for the six months before they took the class, and the six months after they took the class, and then I compare the difference. And we provide intelligence reports for managers and executives to determine really what to sell, where to sell, and how to improve the accuracy so they can get the most out of their teams. And when we track against these targets um, around performance, we see that um, we see that improvement uh, we see that improvement dramatically accelerate and also clearly tied to a particular course. So that's how we're able to, to show it at the course level. And the last one here is around um, communicating um, constantly. Um, providing visibility to your work and the results of your effort is absolutely vital to your success. And in my learning group, we have um, a communication strategy and, we, and an execution plan for that strategy for every business group and every client. Um, it's just built in sort of the regular cadence of how we do work. So we drive a monthly newsletter that goes out to the sales audience and a quarterly newsletter that goes out to the entire company. Um, and all of our communication is sent through Marketo, which is – there's other um, tools out there, but this is, happens to be the one that we use. Um, and um, through Marketo, we can get metrics on how many people viewed the message, how many people scrolled through the message page, how many people clicked through uh, to the details of a, of a link. You know, for more information, click here, and they, also, uh, they clicked through, and how much time they spent on that uh, page and where they branched from there. Instead of just sending out a communication, I send all my communication through Marketo so I can track who's viewed it, and, and where I might need to do follow-up or reinforcement communication if not enough people have opened it in a particular region or something like that. Our communication plans vary sort of depending on the assets that we're promoting, but our strategy is, is pretty consistent. And the, and the strategy is really around that it's, it's a predictable cadence, right? So people know when it's coming out. It's like a regular train schedule. You know, you get on the train. Um, our strategy is that it's targeted by, by audience and what are the specific needs of that audience. Um, all the communication that we send out is very actionable, like do this, take this action. If I'm just generally informing people, you know, they don't want that, right? They, they, the learner or the um, person in the audience is saying, well, what do you want me to do? What action do you want me to take? If you're just informing me, maybe you can wait because I'm busy, right? Um, and everything that we send out is also time sensitive, right? Um, and everything that we do is also then measurable through Marketo. Um, and the um, newsletters are incredibly concise, right? It's, we're not just talking about actions, but we're communicating results. So our organization is all about results, and our communication is an important part of our brand, right? So the communication aligns with the type of programs we have, and it aligns with the type of department we are, which is very quick, it's concise, it's results-oriented, um, it communicates the business impact, right? So I have an example here of, um, of a newsletter that we send out. So on the front page of the newsletter, it talks about you know, specific classes that drive improvement, right? So it's about data and metrics. And then we have to really ask ourselves, well, well why are we doing this? You know, what does this all come back for? What, you, know, what, you know, what's all the fuss about? And so as a, as a reminder of why we're doing all this learning stuff in the first place, it's, it's really to drive business results for our company, right? Um, you know, we care about shareholder value. And a great learning and development organization drives a strong learning culture. And companies with a strong learning culture are 46% more likely to be first to market, have a 37% greater employee productivity, be 34% better at responding to customer needs, have 26% greater product quality, be 58% more prepared to meet the demands of the future, and 17% more likely to be a market share leader. So, you know, being a great learning and development organization is not just so people feel good, right? 
Um, that's nice. That's a nice benefit. But we're here to drive results. We're here. Our job is to enable our resources, enable the humans in our organization to be more effective so they can do their job better so that the company improves in a measurable way. And that's what it all comes down to. So I, I share this slide all the time. This, actually, this comes from uh, Pearson and Associates. But I share this slide all the time when I talk to my clients and my stakeholders and I say, this is why I'm here, right? I'm not, I'm not you know, this is not nice to have. This is have to have, right? Do you want to be competitive? Because, some, because our competitors are doing this, and if we're not, we're going to get left behind. So this is a, a pretty powerful slide that I, that I use when talking to, um, to my clients. So, so that's, uh, that's it for me. Chris, do you um, want to open it up? Hi, uh, yeah. Um, thank you for that, Laura and Jenny. Um, Athena, do you want to ask a question? Yeah. Yes, Chris. Uh, Jenny, Laura, thank you very much. Uh, we can open up the Q&A session with uh, one question that I can see here. Uh, someone is asking, just established 17 new country offices in Africa and Asia. To bridge distance management, we aim to focus on e-learning, social media, to align learning with our strategy. How to apply e-learning globally, free of cultural differences and learning back backgrounds? That was a pretty long one. <laughs> Um, and I'm very conscious that we're very short of of time now, but I think one of the things that we found with these top learning companies um, and looking at some of the things that Jenny and I have been discussing is that we do need to be thinking about our organizations um, within context and communicating within context. Many things are driven centrally, but they need to be implemented locally. And so I think one of the things that you need to do is maybe go back on those seven areas that we've just been talking about and think how much of this can be done centrally, and then how much is locally owned and can be done locally. When we think about learning innovation, um, about maybe centrally creating programs, but locally creating job aids, and what does this mean for us? So I think it's really important that we apply each of those seven steps, um, both at a central and a localized basis. We're going to get engagement and change within the whole organization. So I'm, and I'm conscious that we are short of, of time, and uh, both... Um, Jenny and my Twitter um, IDs are on, on this uh, screen that we've left up here. And also that you can contact us via email and you know, via, um, via LinkedIn as well. So um, I will, I'll just we'll leave it at that. But Jenny, I don't know if you've got one very short recommendation about doing things globally um, from your perspective that we can leave with. Um, I, I think what you said, Laura, was, was great and spot on. Uh, short, sharp answers. Putting it into practice, though, we have to hand back to you as our uh, webinar participants. And we're just, we, I think Jen, Jenny and I both believe that um, you know, if we can take just one thing that we've heard today and do that differently, take action on one thing, we'll take you one step closer um, to achieving your goals and aims for your organization. So um, do let us know directly if there's anything else you'd like to know from us to help you take that one step of action as a result of today. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, ladies, for taking the time to give this very interesting presentation. And many thanks to everyone who joined us live. We have now reached uh, the end of today's live session. As mentioned before, any unanswered questions will be followed up on directly by the speakers. And just before I let you go, a couple of quick points. Uh, the session has been recorded and will be made available on on-demand with a copy of the slides within the next 48 hours. And you will receive an email containing the link you need. Also, please take a moment to fill in our post-event survey that will pop up soon as you leave this session. Uh, your feedback is really important to us as we want to continue to offer you quality webinars on the specific topics you want. Uh, one final thank you to our sponsor, Success Factors, and all live attendees. This session is now over. Goodbye and have a great day. <laughs>